So welcome to the uh, Education Policy and Social Analysis Programs uh, Department's uh, annual jobs panel, uh, where we come and talk about what our possible futures could look like with some great alumni and friends this year. Um, so we're going to spend, um, tonight we have two, two main objectives. We're going to spend a good chunk of time chatting with our beautiful and wonderful panelists about their experiences um, coming up through either their program here at TC or their, their own program um, where they got their master's degree in policy or policy related um, great things. Uh, and the, the process they went through to find employment in their field after and what it was like and we'll pick their brains about like what they would do differently if they could. Um, and so we'll, we'll chat for a while, we'll open it up to Q&A, and then we'll have time for an informal meet and greet afterwards uh, where you can get up close and personal and pick their brains one on one. Um, so let's get started. Um, if we could just go down the line and y'all could please introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us your name, um, your, the program that you graduated from, and your graduation year, uh, your current role, and a quick overview, like your elevator pitch, of what you do in your current role. Yeah, I can, I can remind you if you need it. Oh, okay, I mean, I'll start, sure. Uh, hi, my name's Christy. I uh, graduated from TC last year, actually, 2017. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was in the social ed program with a concentration in ed policy. Oh, I am currently, I'm trying to remember all the things. Um, I'm currently a research and data analyst for Bank Street Education Center, which is in Bank Street College of Education, which is like two minutes away. Um, and basically what I do is I do a lot of backend data for one of our projects, uh, which is the Pre-K for All initiative. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Joseph, I'm the uh, Senior Education Policy Analyst for the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Uh, I went to NYU, I went to the, the rival education <laughs> policy school of uh, Steinhardt, uh, and I received a degree there last year, December, a recent, a recent graduate as well, um, in Educational Leadership, Politics, and Advocacy, or ELPA. Uh, what, what were the other questions? Uh, and what you do in your role. Oh, what do I do in my role? Okay. So, um, as Gail's ed policy analyst, I act as an advisor on educational issues. She is an uh, elected official, and so she has to be knowledgeable on all things within her borough of Manhattan, uh, which is unfair. So she has a team of policy folks. I handle the education, technology, and some of the like healthy eating stuff. I'm a new vegan. Uh, and so I advise her on these issues by just staying abreast of the research, the contemporary research and education, um, history of it and all of that, and also just help her with her advocacy efforts, so staying in touch with the community, networking with folks, uh, you know, writing to the chancellor and the mayor, having meetings with these people, and, and sometimes yelling at them to do what we want them to do. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Terry Kim. I graduated from the education policy program in 2013, so I feel like the oldest one here. Um, I currently work as a senior policy analyst at Children's Aid. Uh, so we rebranded, so we, we used to be called Children's Aid Society, but now we're Children's Aid. So uh, we are a community-based organization um, providing comprehensive services throughout New York City, um, you know, partnering with public schools. We have school-based health clinics. Our founding was actually in child welfare and have had various iterations over the years. Um, and currently in my role, uh, I think what's really unique as a community-based organization that provides direct service is we do have an Office of Public Policy. Uh, we're a small but mighty team, and we I like to kind of categorize the work we do in kind of three bucket areas. So firstly, government relations, government affairs, uh, really maintaining good relationships with our elected officials. Uh, the Man Manhattan Borough President obviously is one of them, uh, as well as government agencies. Uh, the second piece of work, uh, is around advocacy and coalition work. So we do a lot of advocacy at all levels of government, um, city, state, federal, with various partners on varying issues. So my specific portfolio of work is around community schools, um, just kind of with my education policy background. Uh, and thirdly, 
you know, light policy analysis in terms of just really trying to stay in front of legislative legislation that's coming down the pipe, um, kind of what are implementation concerns that are happening with community-based providers as well as, uh, you know, challenges that we are having as a community-based partner within our schools as well. Um, How's it going, everybody? My name is Patrick Gladstone Williamson. I uh, I went by Gladstone when I when I went to Teachers College. I graduated in 2016, so you, some people in here may know me as Gladstone as well. And I I respond to both. It's always you know it's not as simple as what's your name with me. Um, but uh, yeah, so I graduated 2016 from Education Policy, um, and currently I'm the program manager at the Mastery Collaborative, uh, and the Mastery Collaborative is in the New York City Department of Education Office of Leadership, which is in the Division of Teaching and Learning. And basically, we have 43 schools across New York City that are uh, public schools, uh, middle and high schools that are implementing competency-based education. Um, we call it mastery-based education, but they're synonymous um, for all doing purposes. And basically, it's a, a shift away from traditional education uh, in many aspects from, you know, a shift away from alphanumeric grading to a shift away from uh, kind of like just traditional practices, the roles that we sit in, um, you know, the, what we expect, what we conceptualize a student to have to act like and, and how that then um, trickles into our grading practices, our facilitation styles, um, and also just like our school-wide uh, environment of, of culturally responsiveness. I think that um, something that's unique about the Mastery Collaborative because competency-based education um, is mandated in a couple states like uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, I think Colorado, um, but these are also states that don't reflect the 70% black and Latino students that we have in New York. So we do see it as a priority to look at mastery-based education with a culturally responsive lens. Um, and we're like really spearheading a movement of that incorporation that, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's it's exciting times. I was just talking to um, one of my professors here, um, Kevin Doherty, and the concept of the policy entrepreneur is something that really stuck with me while I was here. Um, and thinking about the ways in which like national mood right now is allowing for equity and you know these these like these words like diversity and all of this stuff like they're they're like trendy words right now in the DOE, which is you know uh, which needs to be dissected but it also needs to be capitalized on. And so like, I feel lucky to be in the position that I am in while it's you know, a hot topic, for lack of a better term. It's awesome. Like all of your work is so, so different, but it's so interconnected at the same time. This is gonna be awesome. Um, so I'd love to know, and we don't have to go down the line. You don't have to answer every question unless one really speaks to you. Um, but what, if anything, did you do when you were a first year to prepare for your, your job hunt and your job catch? I, I, I could take this one. I take, um, so I think the most critical thing I did was dabble. I, I dabbled in different fields. So I took the opportunity to engage in any kind of internship experience I could find. Um, you know, so I. I left the, the program I was in was only three semesters but each semester I found a different internship um, just so I could get a sense of what the work was like in that field so I started out with a real research heavy one I was at the research alliance uh, visiting schools collecting data doing like you know the the grind of data collection um, I did another internship at the Metro Center, sorry, <laughs> the Metro Center, sorry, every day. Uh, at the Metro Center where there was much more advocacy focused, we were doing this sort of responsive research um, with, uh, with, with Megan Hester and, and uh, Natasha Capers of CEJ where we were finding out what issues communities were facing and then giving them this kind of rapid response research. Like, okay, so what's the issue that you're facing? Here's what the research says about that. You can use this to augment your arguments and to advocate for yourselves, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I think I think uh, that was something that helped, and, and also experimenting with my classes. Um, you know, I took courses that I thought were interesting, that you know fulfilled the core requirements of the program, but also that I thought might play a role later in some kind of policy work. I, so I, I guess I came in knowing I, I wanted to do some kind of policy work. So. My answer was just so full. Yeah, it was complete. great. Um, I guess, I, just to add, I, I would agree that my first year, 
Um, and I'm going to be honest, I'm not from New York City, so even I did not have this New York City context of what exists here. Um, so it was really focused in on courses I was really interested in. Um, I'll also say I uh, was a work-study student at, uh, now it's called the Center for Educational Equity. It was the Campaign for Educational Equity. And, you know, part of the reason why I pursued, because they, they had so much work in New York City and it provided a lot of great context and definitely took courses with uh, Michael Rebell. Um, so really trying to understand what I don't know um, and really diving into, you know, just picking up new experiences, new knowledge. Um, I would say particularly for me, not growing up in the Northeast, uh, really wanting to understand some of the political dynamics here. Um, as I think of these questions, I try to disassociate kind of like just, you know, almost my lived experience and what, you know, because the, the short answer to all of these is that there's no one size fits all answer in terms of like the, this like whole job search. Um, you know, another book that we used to read, used to read, that we read in uh, Doug Reddy's class um, was called Paying for the Party. The idea of like, you know, when you're in these spaces, you're not just paying for the content knowledge that, you know, um, they're providing you. And also, you know, coupled with, you know, there's a really prominent scholar, Zaretta Hammond, that does a lot of work with culturally responsive education and the neurological, uh, like, the neurological basically argument, because um, oftentimes when we talk about like teaching black and brown students, there's like a moral, like, come on, help the kids. But like, you know, she takes on the stance of like, no, neurologically, like the cortisol levels of these students will literally, um, you know, their lives will end earlier. Um, and it's more, it, it, and so like taking all these things into play, like when I think about what is most necessary, I think it's for you to be your most genuine self. And like, we're all, we're all like, on this journey of figuring out who we are, um, but doing your best in any situation to kind of like present your best self, which is difficult, and you know your best self can be seen differently in these hallways. You know what I mean? So you know navigating that as well. But um, like that's what really that's what really allowed for all of the opportunities that I've had because you never know where they're gonna come, and you don't approach people with the intent of like you're gonna be useful for me later on, mm -hmm. but uh, in a lot of ways, like your peers are the biggest network of students that you have, and they're right next to you. Issa Rae recently was talking about how, um, you know, one of the things she did to get to where she's at is she networks horizontally as opposed to like, you know, oftentimes it's like, which professor should I work under? And that's important too, to get to know your professors, but also get to know your fellow students, because, you know, right now I'm working with a friend that when we were here, we were kind of like student coalition building and holding the institution accountable for uh, recruitment of diverse faculty and staff and also inclusion in the like culture of the school. Um, and now we're doing advocacy work together like outside of grad school, you know what I mean? And obviously it's, it's, sometimes it doesn't work out like that, but it just reminds you that the only way that I could have been doing this work with him, the way that we're doing the work is if from the beginning it was genuine, you know? I guess I'll add my two cents. I honestly didn't really think about much my first year. Uh, that might be like a faux pas to say. I didn't really think about where I wanted to work and where I wanted to go. Honestly, it's just I, you know, I was with my friends. Again, like your friends are your network. And eventually where you end up and where they end up will be pretty different, but you can also, I don't want to say leverage, but you can leverage your friendships to help you get to where you want to go. So just make friends. <laughs> right on. And in all of your answers, I heard a lot about like dabbling in everything and like really like bringing your best and most authentic self to every situation and like getting to know your your peers. How how did and I, I would love to like kind of get meta on that. Like how did all of those experiences and all of that that dabbling and talking and like bringing it how did that translate into you like literally figuring out what you want to do? I mean, I will say, because I know that was part of the questions, like I'm still figuring it out. Um, <laughs> so that's a huge point, because you know, in your career, I think there's multiple transitions and you have varying experiences. And I think you know, prior to working at Children's Aid, I was actually at the DOE. Um, and I learned a lot, right? So I dabbled in this and I was like, mm, you know, there are some other areas that I want to grow and learn. And so I think, 
part of it is that, right? Like really connecting with yourself and being, you know, what are issues I care about? What are environments that I can really put my best foot forward? Can, mm -hmm. I can really be who I am. Um, and where do I feel that I'm most valued in making an impact? And so, you know, while I was at the DOE, I was still a student at Teachers College. Um, and it was amazing, like working what is now called the Field Support Centers. Uh, this was during Bloomberg structure, so it has restructured quite a bit since I was there. Um, and it was great. I was doing large operation management, over 300 schools, so I was seeing everything from this really high level. Um, but it got to a point where I wasn't quite doing policy, and I was like, what does policy look like in practice? Um, I think another piece of it, kind of why I pursued my education policy background, was kind of what were the foundational experiences that brought me here. And it was around my work in youth development and mentoring young people out in South LA. And I just felt very disconnected. And not to say I think the DOE, there's a lot of great experience there. And there is a huge network from TC that work in the DOE, so lean into that as well. Um, but for me, particularly, I, I was really seeking something else where I honestly can kind of be doing systems change work and also still connected to the community. And I, again, will say I think it's just very unique that Children's Aid, as a community-based organization, nonprofit provider, um, that we are flexing those policy and advocacy muscles where I am you know, doing some large advocacy campaigns at the state, coalition work at the city, all levels. And you know, I, I think working with partners who are really passionate about these issues and doing what we can to really kind of agitate the system, whether it's on a budget advocacy lens, uh, legislative, even just kind of process procedures of policies that are coming out. And so, um, yeah, so still figuring it out, but mm -hmm. I think those varied experiences as you're going through different positions um, just kind of crystallize certain things that are important for you. I guess also like, sorry. <laughs> Wanna go? Okay, um, I mean, you came, you came to TC. You came to a certain program for a reason. I think you should always let that drive you, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever that reason happens to be. And it can also change and evolve over time. I'm not saying that it's not going to, but again, you're not always gonna get your dream job the first time around. And then so it's gonna take some time to figure out like this: is this actually what I want to do? Am I really interested in this? Um, is there another aspect of so-and-so that really inspires me? And so I think, you know, don't, don't be afraid to try new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think, um, like, as I'm thinking, I'm also going through almost like a spiritual metamorphosis, like, at the moment, like, currently in my life. And so a lot of my, I'm glad you, that you said let's take it meta because I feel like that's just where my head is at. Um, because in so many ways, it's like, you know, as we ask this question, we also need to ask ourselves, what are our intentions behind what we think we should do because of what program we're in or whatever it may be? And like, sometimes, you know, people, I've seen people graduate from education policy and realize that they wish they did counseling psych and like go to another master's program in counseling psych. You know what I mean? And um, through that experience, if, if you're not, you know, if you're not aware of like, you know, the reasons why, my mom would always say like, if you do what you feel is right right now, after analyzing the situation and it turns out to be like, you know, a poor decision or whatever, whatever, you can't look back with regrets because all you can do is act from where you have your understanding right now um, and, and, and always like seek to evolve in that regard. So it's like, um, I don't know, sometimes, like for me, for example, working for the DOE, you know, my, my interest was more so like I was in the education policy program and I had a specialization around media, uh, culture and education. So it was really focused on like media literacy and thinking about the ways in which like we no longer, like are we ever gonna live in a time where media and culture aren't like blurred lines where like, you know, you can clearly separate the two. Um, and so I did that and then, you know, media has always been, you know, black men representation and everything like that has always been my passion. And then I got the job at the DOE and it's kind of like you put your head down and you just like get really good at the job that you do, which you should, you know, once you get a job, you know, try to be your best at it. Um, but sometimes you lose yourself in the process. And I think that I'm at a phase where like I'm looking up and I'm, you know, I'm not too sure where I'm at. Um, and so I've been like journeying to the soul to be like, where? 
you know, and, and, and again, like, no matter what decision you make, it's a, it's a part of your journey. Like, you can never have any decision you make not be a part of your journey. Um, and so regardless of where it is that you land, it's like there's job descriptions and then there's the humans that fill that job description with their humanness and, you know, everything like that. I think one of the biggest things, which is obviously easier said than done, is just having the confidence in yourself to know that even sometimes when others tell you that, like, the job can't be done this way or, like, you know, when you get people that are, uh, I believe the kids call them haters, like, you know, to, to realize that sometimes, you know, people inflict onto you um, what they weren't able to do or like what they can't imagine is possible, but you can because you know yourself. Um, and so like that, I forget what the question was. <laughs> You're exactly. Yeah. But like that, that's like, you know, that's, that's really where it's at, you know? It's like really if you know yourself, you know what you can provide, you can advocate for yourself, which is another thing that they don't teach us how to do. Whoever they is, we know who they is. Um, But I think just to emphasize, it's a process. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. totally a process. And Lifelong. Mm -hmm. okay. It's really affirming for me to hear y'all y'all say all of that because I those are those are feelings that I feel every day. Um, so thank you guys for being so honest about. You know, it's not magic, and when you get your diploma, you like automatically know exactly your life goals and path. Um, so that's that's really really helpful and comforting that like knowing no decision is a wrong decision. Mm -hmm. um, but I I'd love to to pivot like in in this like beautiful time of like discovering who you are and where your passions lie. Like how how did you go about searching for a job? And like if you could get specific about like where did you look, be it LinkedIn or Idealist, et cetera. Like how how did you begin this like beautiful messy process? I got my job because of LinkedIn. I, I actually did. It was it was probably the first time that website played such a, a crucial role in my job hunt. I've had like twelve careers at this point. Um, so <laughs> the way I searched for jobs. I, I used all the usual sites, you know, the indeed.com, the idealists.org, like, I, I, you, whatever. Like, I used those. I used my network. You know, I looked for openings at the places where I interned, mm -hmm. and I, I definitely applied for jobs at those places, but, you know, they, they, may, they didn't really pay enough. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but it, it turned out to be LinkedIn, because what happened was I found that a friend of a friend worked in this office. Mm. And uh, th this uh, Aisha, who I think was going to be on, on the panel, and, I, and she used that to leverage me to, to, to be here now. Um, so I, I found that a friend, a very good friend of mine, was, had a friend at this organization at the Manhattan Borough President's Office, and she was on her way out of the job. And so I, I, I talked to her about it. I, I talked to my friend, put in a good word, and I met her you know, for some coffee, and we talked about the job. And, um, we connected that way, and, and uh, so I, I sort of leveraged my network to get a word in with uh, Gail Brewer, and you know, next thing you know, I, I was hired. But um, I, I would say that was one thing. But the, the other thing I would say is really, and I'm gonna, probably going to keep reiterating this throughout the night, is that internship experience. I, I really can't emphasize that enough, because uh, I feel like I learned what I didn't want to do. I learned I didn't want to be a, a wonky uh, data uh, Thank you. Focus. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it just wasn't for me, right? It wasn't for me, you know. I, but I learned that advocacy was really where where my heart was and, and where my, my thinking was. And so, um, as important as data is for that work, I felt like I wanted to be more on the advocate side of things. And so, I looked for jobs that would lend well to that desire, right? And so I was looking at uh, nonprofits. I was looking at foundations. I was looking at a lot of local organizations in Brooklyn and Manhattan, right? And so. Through my uh, internships, I learned like where those organizations were and who were the people involved in them, right? So the internship experience helped me network in that way. Um, also, I could apply for openings at the places where I interned, right? And I already had a foot in the door because I'd been there before. I already knew the people there, and so there was an incentive for them to hire within their intern pool, right? Because they want people who already know how their office runs, who know where things go, who know who to talk to when you need what done, right? And they know that I, you know, had a graduate degree from NYU because that's why I was interning there. And so that, and so if you're from TC, they'll know that about you if you're interning, right? And so you'll have a lot of advantages in that sense, right? 
Um, but I also want to emphasize diversifying your internships, right? Because that way you just have more options open to you, right? If you intern at one place, then you have that advantage at one place. If you do it three different places, then you have it at three different places, right? Um, and from there, you know, you, you, I think another thing I did uh, that helped me was, was going to conferences. There, there are a lot of education conferences every year. Uh, we, there's a, we just had a big one in New York, the AERA conference. It's an annual one. Uh, last year, I was at the Data for Black Lives. It was, it was a great one at uh, MIT. And so I would say keep your ground to the air for conferences, because those are just networking cesspools. Right? Like, that's like really the, the I, I mean, you, you see some good presentations. You get, well, take part of some panels and whatnot. But, but the real, I think the real key to those conferences is who you meet, right? You meet researchers from across the country, if, if that's the kind of conference it is. You meet people in, in the city that you didn't even know about. Um, and so, you know, even if you're an introvert like myself, networking can actually become a, a pretty uh, pivotal part of your job hunt. Um, people that just met you for a weekend might recommend you for something just because they trust your personality. They, they saw the kind of things you were offering in the group discussions. And, you know, so um, it's, it's helpful to get your name out there. And if, if you have business cards, you can mm -hmm. hand those out. So yeah. that would be mine. I just want to give a shout out to Gosha. So mm. y'all need to look at her email, but yeah. the, this is where I'm saying like the, the network at TC. So my connection to the DOE was actually through a former graduate at TC um, who was working at the DOE. And when I left the DOE, now there's a, another former graduate of TC who's there. So, so that's one. There's like kind of the network piece at TC. Um, and there is always, and I'm still on those emails, so there's always interesting positions and then leaning into your network. I think looking at LinkedIn and seeing where those connections are as well. Um, I think another piece that I would also advise is, and what I was also doing as I made the transition out of the DOE is just like, you know, really centering around what are issues I'm interested in, um, following those organizations, so doing some research. Social media is huge. I think if you are on social media, particularly Twitter, you can get a sense of kind of what are issues that organizations will comment on, what's some of the work that they're doing. Um, so following those organizations as well and seeing kind of where those connections are, whether it's within your own network, whether it's on LinkedIn. Um, I agree with conferences um, or any kind of training. So I just mm. did an undoing racism training a week mm. ago and met some really phenomenal K through 12 kind of recruitment folks. Um, but you, you'll just meet a lot of interesting people at these events. Um, and there are some other kind of interesting listservs um, that you could probably join. I know one's young educational, what uh, young education professionals, New York City. So they, there are also a massive listserv where they are jobs as well. Um, I know I wish I could say there's like this very clear yeah. kind of way to go about it. Um, I will say increasingly as I work in this space in New York City, it is not so small of a world, um, which is great. And you kind of meet people where you have connections. And so I do think the network is huge. Totally agree with Patrick about networking horizontally because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always just about getting to the top. Okay. Uh, I did everything under the sun. Oh. LinkedIn, Idealist. Um, there's one for ed policy in particular, also like political campaigns. I looked into that. Mm. Um, the higher ed jobs is another one that I looked into. All those like search engines that you can Google and find your way into, just do it. Um, TC also has I think for like the ed policy job search engine, they actually have like a password you can use because some of those jobs are password protected. So like use use TC mm. as your guide to help you because then you can unlock those jobs. Um, I actually, uh, to be honest, I think I got super lucky. Um, I got my current job through an old professor of mine. So he actually was contacted somehow um, by someone who works at Bank Street and they were looking to expand. This job was actually not posted anywhere online. It wasn't advertised at all. So what happened was she got in touch with my professor and my professor blasted all of his students. So then that's how I like sort of got the ball rolling. And I think something that really, really did the trick was that um, the person who had my job previously did the same uh, program that I did called CEPRL, Center for Public Research and Leadership at the law school. Um, so in that sense, like we had 
very similar connections. The projects that we did were very similar. And because she also came from my same program, it seemed befitting that I step into her role. So I think I got really lucky my first time. Um, and so it just kind of like fell into my lap. But I will say like that came a good few months after I started my job search. So didn't happen like instantly. And you say you say lucky, but I, I see that you were probably just like a person that people enjoyed being around beforehand also that like <laughs> had you in their mind um, beforehand because mm -hmm. you know you think about just like you know I've learned a lot about the HR process from being on the other side and um, you know it's not always about the candidate you know it's a, a lot of times those positions are filled before you apply to them you know and that's that's something that you know I don't know that that all oh, this recording is best for me but uh, <laughs> But like, I don't know, and so when you think about that, you think about the fact that like, you know, I, th I think what, what I learned from the most was the jobs that I applied for and my process of applying was just, you know, like submitting a cold resume or like, you know, that I've never gotten a job off a cold resume, you know? And so when I'm sitting here, I'm also thinking about how my job process was really about the people that I knew, the people that they knew, never really looking for a position unless like, you know, I was. Um, but like things just kind of like I was working in the office of the provost and then like, you know, I, part of my job there was to organize the uh, post minority doctoral fellowship is a fellowship that's out of the Institute for Urban and Minority Education here. And it happens every year. There's two postdoc fellows. Um, and so over the years, it was the 20th year anniversary when I was there. So I was helping to organize like outreach for for like a weekend that they all would come back and I like and I, that wasn't my intention of, get, you know, I was looking to pay loans and like, you know, uh, but through that I ended up just meeting a wealth of just like, you know, um, deans of colleges and, and you know, uh, English language learner, um, you know, like teachers and professors and like, it was just this amazing mix of things that, you know, I had, that wasn't my intention and then um, I crossed paths with them. So in light of all of this, I would say like, look at this even though it's not a game because you need to get paid you need to have some stability in life but you also should look at the hypocrisy of like how we see kind of like meritocracy or like you know it's not fair footing you know when people know people and people don't know people so when you look at it through that lens you can also look at it through the lens of like this is a game so like you know i i walked into teachers college uh, and they didn't, you know, I didn't get funding um, for my education here. I had gotten into Brown and I got a chunk of funding. So if I had accepted that, I would have had to pay more. But instead, when I came to orientation here, I went straight to financial aid. I sat down with them. I explained to them my situation. I leveraged my resource of Brown. Um, and ultimately, they almost matched what Brown gave me. And if I hadn't gone in there, you know, who's, who knows if I would have came here, you know what I mean? I could have just accepted that I wasn't. So I think going in and showing that urgency, doing something that's like, you know, again, people can't tell you what the right path is, but you can, you can see like, oh, you know, like maybe I could slide in here. Maybe I, I know my strengths is right here. And oh, she went to my college? Oh, let me go talk to her. You know what I mean? Like every, there's connections everywhere that you have that, that none of us have, you know what I mean? So leveraging those, you know, I think everybody's aware like even now I'm in a position where people are reaching out to me for job opportunities and like, I never take offense to it. You know, some people would be like, now you want something now that, I, now that I'm popping. And like, nah, it's just like everybody looking for opportunities. I'm looking for opportunities right now. Not necessarily for a job, but like, you know, cheap flights. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everybody's looking to network at all times. Not everybody, but you know. What you just said really resonated with me about how you know we're we're always like it, it's this game that we play where we like sneak in and like it's who you know and like leveraging all of that and something that's really important to me personally is like leveraging my own opportunities and institutional knowledge um so now i want to make y'all do that um you you've all endured the job interview process um in, in getting a job in education. And I don't know if your experiences are similar to mine, um, but it can be arduous. And I would love if you could share your knowledge of what these these interviews can look like so folks can be better prepared for those like three hour data task, like interview nightmares. Um, or maybe your experiences have been different. Uh, 
So I, I had a unique interview experience for this job. Um, after I graduated from NYU, I, I took a little self-congratulatory trip to uh, Singapore. And I was actually interviewed while I was in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and, and it wasn't by Gail, it was by the chief of staff, but um, we used Skype, I believe, Skype, or maybe FaceTime, one or the other, um, to, to do this interview. This was like a, a 30 minute interview. Um, and the questions were, they were right up my alley, to be honest. It, it, was, it was a very, um, it was an easy interview. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like if you're, I mean, I went to an education policy program and I was getting questions about education policy, right? So I felt totally confident about the question, like to answer these questions, you know, they're asking me about my opinions on things and my research interests. And so it was very easy to just answer these questions honestly. Um, I, I know not every interview is like that. I, I did interview for a different job, and it was a totally different experience but before I accepted this one. And so this was at the, the Metro Center um, at NYU, and this was like a two-hour interview, right? This was like a two-hour interview with people that I had been working with for a semester, right? I, I had interned there. Um, and so these questions were, they essentially asked me what the education system should look like. Uh, but within two hours, I had to essentially unpack what I thought <laughs> in an ideal world every layer of the public education sector should look like. And so for interviews like that, really hard to prepare for that. You know, um, at, at NYU, I don't know if they do this at TC, but we, we all came up with an education platform. It's like a 30-page document of all of our stances and opinions on the presiding educational issues of, of the time and of educational history. Um, stuff that I'm real nerdy about and, and, and like to, to write about and talk about. So, so it, it was fine. But um, so, so that was pretty grueling, right? There was a lot of questions. Um, they didn't ask me to do any like data analyses on the spot, but they did ask me to do some data analyses in my head. Like, like, I, was, like I didn't have to create a product, but there were some like, you know, questions about, like what linear regressions, like the basics about longitudinal data, like just to see where what my understanding was of these sort of common terms in, in, the, in the policy world. Um, and so you can get you can get those interviews, you know, and uh, hard to prepare for. But um, I think it's good to just be honest about what you know and what you don't know, uh, because the employer is also trying to find out, right, what role you can play in the organization. And it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're not, you know, the absolute best at everything, that they can't use you or that they don't think you would provide anything to the to the organization. It just means they need to know what they need to what holes they need to fill with their other hires potentially, right? Um, that was the case with, with E.J. Rock at, at uh, Metro Center. Um, where I am now, at the Borough President's office, um, very different interview, right? So it was a 30-minute interview. Uh, questions were mostly opinion-based questions, because um, they really want to see if my stance on issues had any alignment with the Borough President's, right? It'd be really difficult for her to advocate for policies if her education policy guy was like really pro-charter because she's really anti-charter, right? Um, and I guess now you know where I stand on charters. And so, uh, so, there, so things like that, right? It, so my honesty got me this job just because I was very honest about where I stood on the issues. You know, I think for like 10 minutes we were making fun of Eva uh, <laughs> during that interview. So there, there, there was, it was that kind of thing, right? Um, but I also want to emphasize, while, while we're on this topic of interviewing and job hunting, that it's important to be picky, right? You, you just because you're, you just graduate a program and you might be desperate for a job, maybe you don't get a job in a month, you might feel like just taking the first thing that comes your way, right? You might feel like, oh, I gotta pay the bills. And if you do, then you do, right? You do what you gotta do. But if you can afford to wait longer, to look for a better fit, I highly recommend doing that. Um, and I also recommend having that attitude during the interview process, mm. right? You should think of what can I learn from this place, right? Well, it, it, during every interview I have, I always ask, what are the opportunities for growth here? Like, what can I learn? Will you subsidize my learning experience? Because I will go to conferences. I will. I, I found the value of those when I was in graduate school, and I, I can't turn back now, right? I, I know how valuable they are for my professional life and for my professional development. And they're just an excellent resource. And so whenever I had an interview, I was like, all right, well, if I want to go to the AERA conference, will you pay for it? <laughs> like straight up, will you pay for it? Like, will you help me with that? And if the answer is yes, great. If it's no, then I'm, I'm going to think twice about working there, right? 
you have to remember that you have very valuable skills and knowledge as education policy students. It's, the, it's a very uh, sort of esoteric uh, field that you're in, right? It, so you, you should take advantage of that and leverage that um, during your interviews, during your conversations. It, it's, you're very skilled people. You know things that a lot of people don't know. So you're important to whatever organization you're walking into, right? Um, and so just keep that in mind. And so when you're doing these interviews, one, it'll help you feel a little empowered to know that you have most of the cards actually in your field and that the employer is actually desperately looking for someone because they all are <laughs> very desperate looking for the right person. We're, we're hiring people in my office right now, so you should check out the MBPO's website if you need a job. But um, also, they're desperate. So you should know that they need you just as much as you think you need that job, if not more. They're definitely uh, looking for people desperately. So uh, take advantage of that desperation during your interviews, and, uh, but, but also you know, try to be honest and um, get the most you can out of that. That's comforting. Yeah, yeah, but we've got to add a little positivity. I think um, also, I guess, you know, if you, uh, if you go to TC, if you go to NYU, if you go to Hopkins, Stanford, whatever, you all basically have the same qualifications as each other. You're competing with yourself, essentially. So it's really, it's not like how well you do on a hiring task that's going to make you stand out. It's it's like how you present yourself in an interview. And again, like I really don't think you should be interviewing for a position you don't want. I, I say that, but I've done it before like many times. Um, and at the last second, I've always like withdrawn myself from consideration because I think like, do I want this job for a full year? And then if the answer is no, then it's really, it's not worth it. Um, so if you can give yourself that like, little bit of leeway and like a little bit of time to get a job that you really like with within an organization with a culture that you really like as well I think that's that's most key one thing that I remember Mac Gonzalez who also went to TC um, told me be your most authentic self um, and that really comes through in your interviews a lot of times the people who are interviewing you aren't looking to see like if you're the smartest if you're the brightest if you're the most qualified it's like do you fit in within this organization? Are we going to work well together? Because a lot of times the people who are interviewing you are like, you're going to work really, really closely with them. And if your views don't necessarily align or if you don't get along, then it's going to be really hard for everyone. Um, so, you know, just be, be yourself, be professional, but be yourself. Um, and then if they like you, they like you. If they don't, then that just means that maybe that place isn't right. Yeah, so I'm someone who really likes to prepare ahead of an interview, and I like to think that policy jobs, there's like a larger umbrella of a policy job. So I've never had anything where I've had data questions because nothing within this policy job had something related to that. So I do think that um, as you're preparing for the interview process, just being very clear what kind of position it entails so you can prepare appropriately. But, you know, I echo what everyone says around kind of being yourself, um, being honest of what you know and don't know, but also really valuing that there is a lot that you have to contribute uh, to the organization. They would not offer an interview if they did not see something within your application or a phone interview, et cetera. Um, I really like that kind of exercise of like, if you can envision the education system or like what is your opinion on certain issues, whether that aligns with the organization or wherever you're at, but I think that is something always you should be thinking about and not saying you have an elevator pitch, but being really clear with kind of where you stand on certain issues um, so that you can articulate that and really present that. And in that space, you are being your authentic self too. Right on. Uh, so I'd love to, to open it up to y'all. Uh, what questions do y'all have about the education policy or the, the EPSA, not even policy specific, um, the, the hunt for, for a career. I have a mic, if anyone has a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, it's, for the, I don't, I don't. it's for the recording. <laughs> um, I was, okay. Um, this is actually for you, Patrick. I was wondering how you reconcile when you do have differences between, you know, 
your representative and you and how you go about, um, I guess, understanding those differences and being able to communicate them. Obviously, you're their mouthpiece sometimes. So how do you how do you reconcile that with you on like a daily basis, I suppose? That's a great question. Uh, it's a difficult one. Um, so so a few things happen. Right. Um, I would say step one is I remind the borough president she has constituents. Right. And so, I mean, she doesn't need to be reminded of that she has constituents, but I try to remind her that what I'm echoing is coming from her constituents. Right. So if there's um, so like, let's say some issue arises like a school truncation. Right. Let's say a DOE wants to shrink a school, close out like six through eight grades. Right. Um, the community there, the community for that school might be really opposed to that truncation. Right. Uh, on face value, the DOE might present a very compelling argument based on data, et cetera, um, but the data doesn't show the kind of emotional and mental impact that a school, essentially a school closure, would have on those middle school students, right? And so the borough president might, this, this is actually a fantasy at this point because she wasn't really on this side of the argument, but she might um, say that she sides with the DOE here. The data says this is, this is a bad school. We should, of course we should close it, right? Um, so step one for me would be to present the argument of her constituents in that area because she's like all borough presidents. She's very busy, is all over the place doing events and speaking everywhere. And so she's not going to know exactly what like the five tracks around the school are saying about the school closure, right? Um, so that's kind of my job is to keep her informed of, what's, of what the happenings are. Um, so let's say that doesn't work. Like, that's not enough. The second thing is to rely on my, my research background, right? And so I'll say, okay, well, there's that. But then there's also all of this research-based evidence that you should really consider. And so using the preponderance of evidence for some point, I'll use that to try and argue that we should, that our values or our views should be aligned with that community's, right? Um, and let's say that doesn't work. Let's say the, the evidence isn't good enough. The hearing this from her constituents isn't enough. Um, I work in politics. And so I will say, well, these other politicians, they agree with the community here. And that will get most politicians to change their perspective or to at least investigate something a little bit more if they haven't yet. Um, and, and then there's also just, uh, well, there isn't also just that. So I say those are the three generic avenues, right, for doing this. Um, but within the office, there's just a lot of arguing, honestly. Uh, we have a very dialogue-based office. There's constant argument. Not argument like a spousal abuse argument, but argument as in like classroom arguments, academic argument, right? Like a discussion where people are presenting views and, and backing them up with evidence and, and trying to, you know, win the argument of the day, when, when, when the, uh, the battle of ideas, right? Um, and so I'm very lucky. I, I, not lucky, I guess. I did my research. But I, I picked a borough president to work for who I knew to be open-minded because she's in the sort of advocacy circles and she's well-liked in the borough and that kind of thing. And so I'm lucky enough that I work with someone who is open to argument, right? She'll say what her case is. She'll be very honest about what she doesn't know. I'll be honest about what I don't know and what I do know. And we, we take it from there. Right. Um, so, for example, uh, metal detectors. Right. This this is a, a recent example here. After Parkland, um, the mayor was very quick to, institu to institute a policy where every single middle school and high school student would have to go through metal detectors uh, by the end of by the end of the school year. Uh, as someone who uh, keeps his keeps abreast of the school to prison pipeline and the research in that area, I know how negative metal detectors can be on our most underserved communities, specifically our black and Latino males and, and, and females, and female students, uh, well, let's screw the gender, black and Latino students. Um, and so, but it's not something that I can expect everyone to know about, right? This is, not everyone is in the school's prison pipe research, not everybody's reading this stuff, certainly not your average elected official, right? Um, so this wasn't even on Gail's radar, Gail Brewer, so borough president. It's not even on her radar, right? And so I had to build this argument educator on all the issues, on the research, what that says, what the community is saying. And it was the preponderance of these things that eventually swayed her to say, okay, let's write this letter to the mayor advocating for the removal of metal detectors from schools, not for increased metal detector usage, right? Um, so so I, I think 
bringing, trying to win the battle of ideas, I think is key in this kind of work. If you're working for an elected, if that's the route that you're interested in going in, um, or just for some kind of advocacy group in general, it's, you really want to try to win the, the battle of ideas. So that means you have to know your shit, right? You, you need to be really, really well aware of the issue that you're arguing for and be able to defend it and be willing to defend it, right? Um, so, yeah, that, that, so when we disagree, I mean, she, it's, it's her uh, office. She's the borough president. Uh, if she's totally in disagreement and won't do it, she's not going to do it, right? I, I mean, I can't force her to do something that she thinks is bad for her brand or bad for her constituents or bad for her votership, what have you. Um, but once again, I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with someone who's pretty open-minded. So, yeah. Thanks for the question. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Is anyone else? <laughs> so my question is because I'm an international student, I just wondering, do you have any classmates from I mean have international background? How I mean, do they navigate their career space? Uh, what kind of advice do you want to offer, I mean, for international? Mm. That's, my That's my question. Thank you. It's a really good question, and it was on our list. I wish I had more to say around how to connect international students with opportunities here. Um, you know, I mean, I think some of the things we have shared around who is your network uh, is a big piece of it as well. Um, I would say for everyone, whether you're international or not, of like, right, leaning into your network, um, asking questions, letting people know what you're interested in so that they can be a resource. Um, and yeah, I think looking up kind of if, if the plan is to stay here, right, like kind of navigating that by looking up different organizations and folks that you do know. Um, but it's a really good question. And I'll be honest, I don't think I interface with the international student community as much as I did while I was at TC. I would, I would say um, <clears throat> when you asked that question, I was thinking of a, one of my peers in Kevin Dory's class. Actually, he left. Um, but he, she was from India. And the way that we were talking about class in his course was very Eurocentric, was very around like, you know, the United States. And she vocalized that class systems in India are often heavily attached to last name um, compared to the way that we, you know, that way that race and everything uh, plays into our class system. And like, even her bringing up that question, like I, I won't forget that question because it reminds you that even here, you know, I think that, that, that we're not, extremely explicit about the fact that like the type of education that you get here is very uh, Euro or like very rooted in like the United States unless it's the international programs you know what I mean like there's not a lot of overlap and that and that you know I was I was listening to a uh, to a TED talk the other day by this uh, social critic his name is Jay Smooth and he was talking about why it's so difficult to talk about race um, and he was talking about how we look at uh, the topic of race as, you know, I'm either perfect and fluent in this way of like existing and not exhibiting bias and everything like that, or I'm racist. And there's no room for the in-between, there's no room for conversations to expose your prejudice or expose your imperfections, which we all have, you know, like it's, it's kind of this twisted world where you have to act like you're something that you're not just because you don't want to be the extreme of that thing. Um, and I, I I'm saying this because I see a parallel with that and like with international students, with students coming from so many different countries, I find that people sometimes are not willing to engage or don't take the step out to engage with the international community unless they are a part of it because there is that fear of like, I don't know like any customs of this 
you know, of your country, or I don't know anything about your country in terms of like being able to engage in a conversation um, that's meaningful for you and meaningful for me. Um, and I think that's more so reflective on the privilege that there is to exist in a space where you only have to look at your own culture. Um, and so when you ask that, similarly, I don't, have a, I don't have an answer, but I do have a you know, affirmation towards your inquiry. You know, like that, that is something that was a question when I was here, and I'm sure it's been a question in terms of the overlap between the international community and, and you know, the domestic community. I don't, I don't know. What, um, I mean, I, I might even just nudge, like as an institution, kind of what are the structures in place for us to share those experiences and knowledge? Um, mm -hmm. And be honest, my background, I'm Korean American. There's a huge Korean community here. I never connected, you know, so there's that where I'm not to say, you know, there's much more I could have done, but it is a really valid question um, around how we can build those partnerships and, yeah, just connections with one another. Can I ask a question? Sure. So are you, is everyone here, like, near the end of their program? Is, is you're close to the end or is it just starting or anything? Are you near the end, the, the uh, international student? No, just you just started? Oh, okay, wonderful. So oh, awesome. I, I, I do have a suggestion, I do. Um, so there, was, there were two students from Chile in my class uh, at NYU, and in one of my classes at NYU. Um, and something the professor told them to do uh, during our class was to speak about what was happening in Chile, right? To force the, the class to entertain conversations about the education system in Chile, which was, I think, either entirely privatized or becoming entirely privatized at the time, mm -hmm. right? And so it actually served as a, a key piece of our education because this was an education advocacy class. And so we were talking about neoliberalism and the privatization of the public sector and education, the education sector in this case, um, and, and you know the, how that plays with uh, globalization and whatnot. And so getting this sort of sense of the logical extreme, what happens when an entire education system is, is privatized. We actually had an example in Chile. Um, and so I think international students can add a lot of value to class for students who don't have those experiences. And you can force them to reckon with those differences, right? Um, so I, I don't know where you're from or, or if you're planning on staying here after. Or, um, but you know, those students from Chile, they plan on going back to Chile with lessons they learned. Um, so like, we'll start their own organization. Um, it's kind of amazing that they both got in, actually. But uh, so uh, I think that was huge, because they got what they wanted. They got us to interact with their ideas. But it was also incredibly beneficial to, uh, to students who aren't international, because we learned about very different ideas about education. We learned about different cultures and how that works with education, how that impacts education. So I would just say, since you're starting, you're, you're starting your, your uh, school career here, um, your graduate career here, you, I feel like you can take advantage of your experiences by forcing your classmates to reckon with the kinds of education policies that you're seeing and where you come from, right? You can make them engage in those conversations and that way both sides can gain value. Um, yeah. I'll add a little bit. I think your perspective as a non-American is actually pretty powerful, um, especially at TC, we're so like, domestic and we're mm. so just like US centric that it's really hard to see outside of that. So I think that for any future employer, if you plan to stay in the States, that's actually something that is you can really use to your advantage. And second, I think you're already doing like a pretty great job of trying to network being mm. here um, and connecting with your fellow students. And especially because it's your first year, I will say like continue, continue to do that and continue to connect with your classmates and your professors. Sure. Um, um, okay, yes. Hello. Um, class registration starts on Monday. Um, is there any class that you guys are like, you have to take this, the TC people? Um, any class specifically that you think applies well to the work that you're doing now? Oh, gosh. So I think in this, and I don't know if he's on sabbatical, but Luis Huerta? Oh. Ah, yes. Yeah, so he teaches <laughs> like a policy. There's a course he teaches. I remember it was like my... It was excellent uh, because 
One, I will say those memos that we developed, those were part of my writing samples. Um, secondly, I think he just really challenged us to have these debates and dialogues um, around very specific um, issues. Uh, and they, it, that's the one class I definitely still remember. Um, and it was great. When I, I remember I was like picking his brain while I was at Children's Aid. And it's great. You just have these great relationships with the professor. And we were like drinking wine and talking about um, different policy issues that I've been working on. But I will say definitely that class is great. As it relates to kind of what I do now, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that kind of you're all going into anything that's policy writing heavy. I would say currently my role it's not, but at least kind of affirmed like, hey, I have these skills and I have these analytical skills that I can really bring to this organization. I really, well, I came from the social ed uh, program, so I really like social of knowledge with Amy Wells. Um, I believe she's back. So, I mean, that's a very like basic, like 101 type of course, but I think especially if you're in the ed policy program and that's not a required course, it's pretty insightful. You get to understand how people come to have the biases, the biases that they do that we encounter every day. And it's really sort of like deconstructing your thought patterns and also like reflecting upon yourself. There's a lot of like reflection papers and, and all that good stuff. Um, so that's a course I would really recommend. Yeah, I would just encourage courses that, um, again, no one size fits all, but courses that because of the name, because of the teacher, because of like the description of the course, um, seem transferable to you as a person. Like, what, two of the courses that are my most memorable courses here were outside of the EPSA program because of where like, my, my head and my thought process is at. Um, one of them was with Dr. Christopher Emden. It was basically a, um, it, like, it was, it was a life course. Like, he, he exhibits um, kind of the disruption that I, I kind of embody in my soul and you know try to embody in my manifestations but like he really like people go to his class myself included and leave just feeling like a therapeutic slash like you know church experience in his classroom because of the way that he talks he could talk about carving a pineapple and have it be the most engaging thing and tie it back to like race and racism you know what I mean like and those and and that was something that like I didn't want to be paying all this money to come here and not experience his course just because he's not in my program, you know? And like, um, there's another uh, professor like that, Dr. Yolanda Sealy Ruiz, who had the same effect on me um, in terms of her just like, I think out of all the characteristics that I love about her, her ability to be fully present, whether it's with the class or you coming up to talk to her after the class, like she reminds you that like there's heart in this work, you know? And sometimes walking through these halls, there's not a lot of heart you know, and I say that in the, in the sense of like warmth, you know, it's more so like, I gotta, I gotta, you know, there's no chance to be vulnerable and be like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, you know, and there's certain professors that will take you in. And then again, I'm gonna shout him out again, Kevin Doherty. Um, I took a class with him called, <sighs> so politics and urban education, I believe it was called. Um, and that was what I was talking about with like policy entrepreneurs and stuff like that. So like, that's very transferable to the work that I do. And then there's another course, that Doug Reddy teaches, and it's called Sociology of Urban Education. Um, and that was the book, like Paying for the Party. That's our college experience. Like, it, it, it's just like, find, find topics and teachers that are able to bring current events in, are able to bring, because like, if the truth in the way that they teach and in the truth in the content that they cover, if it's, if it's like, you know, aware and conscious, then it will be relevant today. You know what I mean? Because we can never be without like our past. You know what I mean? Um, and there's certain teachers that can acknowledge that. And then there's certain teachers that, you know, have been teaching for 20 years and tenure track and, you know, get that money, you know? That, that was real. <laughs> um, well, I want to take a minute to, to thank you all uh, for your insight and your, your honesty and your authenticity and just like your vulnerability with us today, um, sharing this like tumultuous journey uh, that we're all on together forever. 
Um, and I, I want to close the formal portion of our event tonight, but invite you all to stay. We have wine, we have snacks, uh, and we have great company. Keep picking each other's brains and network horizontally. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming, and let's give our panelists a round of applause.